Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 27th of May, 2020, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Your host today, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish, and we're delighted to be joined by Alex Thompson reporting from the Netherlands. Well, it's the 27th, Mike. We are still effectively locked down, locked up under quasi house arrest uh, absolutely but uh, it's also wednesday which means it's the day after the weekly ons statistics release so let's just uh, briefly have a look at that uh, well the uk deaths registered in week 20 which is up to the 15th of may was 4210 uh, and that's the lowest in six weeks uh, but the picture isn't quite so rosy in total uh, because here is uh, the excess mortality figures uh, from the beginning of this uh, and as we can see uh, between week, weeks 15 and week 16 or sorry yeah between 15 and 16 uh, we have uh, sorry 19 and 20 what am I talking about 19 and 20 we've seen a rise in excess mortality again if we put the actual COVID numbers back on that there hasn't been uh, as I say it's the lowest level for six weeks so uh, the red hatched area therefore is still excess mortality as a result of the lockdown itself. But if we actually take the uh, uh, Italian model as a, an assessment here and, and say that that dotted line, which represents those uh, identified as having COVID, uh, that actually 12% is, is a more accurate representation of that. That's how it looks. Uh, so the red shaded area represents the lockdown deaths. And let's just put uh, a, another dotted line on there, which shows uh, the date that the lockdown came in. Uh, that's a pretty stark graph again, Brian. And uh, as, as we see, you know, lockdown death, or the, sorry, the, the deaths attributed to COVID uh, at the lowest level, level for six weeks. And yet we've got a rise in excess mortality again in, the, in, in week 20. Yeah, and, and the, the mainstream media might just pushing out that huge peak as all COVID-19 deaths. So the fear factor is being rammed home. There's no analysis by the BBC or the rest of UK mainstream media and press as to the real impact of uh, coronavirus. But we know medi many medical people are saying, actually, this virus is a normal winter virus, but we are not seeing any of this reported. It's fear, fear and more fear. Well, and indeed, and, and another question that uh, more and more people begin to ask, and if we can welcome Alex to the programme now. Uh, in France, uh, a week or so ago, we had uh, uh, mainstream reports from France uh, suggesting that uh, COVID-19 had appeared in France around Christmas time. Uh, but here we've got uh, the Italian press saying, in fact, as far back as October, and these results have been described by a doctor named Pasquale Mario Bacco, who is heading a team which has been interviewed first in the local newspaper Brescia Today, which covers the region in Brescia, uh, where the epicentre of Italian infections were in northern Italy and the wider region of Lombardy. It was then picked up nation nationally, but then suppressed. La Stampa uh, picks up the main uh, point that uh, Dr. Bacco was making here, and they are gisting it as uh, that 35 percent, so over a third of the Italian population, was infected. This is on the basis of serological studies. So um, I'm indebted here to a translation sent by a viewer, which uh, saved me time. It's a very good one. Uh, the tests were carried out by an American company named Meliam, M-E-L-E-A-M, and were a four-stage test to see what proportion of the local population in Brescia had developed antibodies. This was carried out uh, about the end of February, actually the beginning of February, the 3rd of February was the first beginning of the, of the um, visiting of over 7,000 people, healthy, asymptomatic people, to see how many of them had the antibodies. And of the 400 patients in the sample in Brescia district, 199, almost exactly half, tested antibody positive. Dr. Bacco says that this indicated that the virus incidence um, was high, that, you know, half. Uh, he reported this to the Istituto Superiore della Sanità, the, the uh, chief uh, health organization in Italy, and to the Italian Ministry of Health. And uh, he's saying, here are our numbers. Here is our serological test. The Ministry of Health said, you need to go and speak to a Professor Roberto Burioni, who I'm told is Italy's answer to, to, to Dr. Fauci. 
They went to Dr. Burioni and said, we think that half of the people in Italy's hottest epicenter um, have developed antibodies so early that they must have been infected in early October. And he replied, that can't be right because the incidence in Brescia is 2%. When we asked him how this was, how he knew this was the case, he replied, quoting the Italian original, original perché è così e noi lo sappiamo, because it is that way and we are the guys who know. Yeah, and, right. And that, that's the arrogance which sets the stall out with regard to uh, COVID-19, of course. Uh, if you don't believe the government line, then... Well, you're a dissident. Mm. Let's come back to Mr. Bubbles, as we described him. This is the gentleman from uh, Oxford uh, Department of Sociology. His name is Per Block, and he's been part of a team with Zurich University uh, modelling events around COVID. And we uh, highlighted the fact that this was the man who was now uh, effectively modelling our future lockdown in this system of bubbles where we know that the government is uh, planning to release us out of our, our rabbit hutches uh, slowly as long as we only mix with a few extra people. And we also commented that medical uh, and um, data trained individuals are saying, well, the trouble with the bu bubbles um, algorithm is that if you follow it through to its logical uh, conclusion, you are going to uh, come into contact somewhere along the line with uh, people who's, who, who um, hold um, uh, residual COVID um, antibodies. antibodies. Thank you, Mike. And therefore, you will still be locked down. But uh, let's just digress back onto the subject of the team that Per Block was working with. And... Um, um, we're going to have a look at other things they were talking about. So we've we've got the actual links to these particular reports on screen. We're always very keen that our viewers uh, can freeze the screen. You can go and search this material out yourself. So don't believe the UK column in the first instance. Go and read the material and then see that what we're saying is correct. But you can do that with the screen. Well, this was one of uh, his friends, <coughs> Uh, this is Marion Hoffman. Um, what we were interested in, that aside from uh, being part of the Bubbles team, Marion Hoffman uh, had retweeted a report later picked up with the British Medical Journal, which was warning about the dangers of lockup on mental health. Now, she actually retweeted it via this gentleman. So I'll need to call this up on the other screen so that I can read it. Sebastian. Uh, Genzeles Dembroskis, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, but uh, this is one of the diagrams in the report. You can find it through the British Medical Journal. And we were particularly interested by this corner up here because what it was saying was that basically uh, lockdown and particular closure of educational facilities uh, was going to increase the risk of exploitation of children um, not in school. And uh, if we move our arrow down, ultimately what they're talking about here is that all of these things um, affecting people in lockdown and particularly children who could be in care lockdown, uh, they're taking it down to attributable morbidity and mortality. So this is very, very serious stuff. And we're very interested that uh, Mr. Bubbles and Marion Hoffman and colleagues are also aware of the dangers of the lockdown, which is being suggested. Now, why are we interested? Well, let's come back to this BBC report from uh, um, a little while ago. This is the 29th of April. Coronavirus abuses target children online in lockdown. And it says that uh, a police force has said reports of online child sexual abuse have increased due to criminals targeting minors during the coronavirus lockdown. Thames Valley Police said it received 64 reports in March compared to 26 for the same month in, two, in 2019. Now, I think that's an increase of, um, uh, of about 200 and something percent. Um, but what the UK column has learned is that actually Thames Valley Police are reporting that there's been a 500% increase on online grooming and child abuse. And despite this huge increase, uh, the BBC and the wider mainstream media in UK will not fully report these alarming increases. Uh, they did report 
as we've just shown you in that BBC one but there has been no sustained investigation by the BBC or other papers into the sheer scale of this increase in abuse as a direct result of lockdown so we're bringing this uh, article which several people have been drawing our attention to this is uh, deals with rape well we uh, the Guardian report here says a rape claim but Barrow MP calls for calm after protests uh, over a rape claim case and a woman 19 has been arrested for breaking bail conditions after being accused of lying about sexual assault how often do we hear this one Mike the abuse victim comes forward and they are the ones that are then caught up in the uh, so-called justice system and that's what's happened here we've got a nine-year-old girl stating 19. that uh, sorry 19 year old girl stating she's been trafficked for sex recently raped and beaten as punishment for not attending parties during lockdown she's accused of lying and sent to jail on remand having broke all bail conditions and is charged with perverting the course of justice she's accused of making false allegations about rape and detective chief superintendent dean holden of cumbria police insisted in a video message that police had conducted a year-long investigation alongside the national crime agency and surprisingly they found no evidence whatsoever now the point we're making is that even with a very very serious case like this with an adult um, it's clear to the people in the Barrow area at least there's no proper police investigation going on and yet when we've got a very large police force Thames Valley Police warning about dramatic increases of abuse of children uh, there's no reporting in the press so um, we're interested in this case because it's being supported by uh, the former Greater Manchester Police grooming whistleblower that's Maggie Oliver um, so there certainly seems to be some substance to this case but um, what is the mainstream media doing at the moment and why uh, do they not want to get near the child abuse issues and we we'll just remind you that uh, if we come back to the bubbles team uh, Marion Hoffman again but she tweeted out this other study which is talking about adverse effects of lockdown on mental health uh, this was a study with regard to students and it says our new blueprint investigates how students social integration and mental health depression anxiety loneliness stress change prior to and during the COVID-19 lockdown so all of this statistical analysis has been done who is going to be affected by depression anxiety loneliness and stress that's children locked up in care um, so if we can see lockdown is uh, damaging children locked up in the care system making it easier for them to be groomed why are we not seeing the BBC and other uh, so-called mainstream media investigating mm -mm. we'll leave you to think about that question um, okay now one of the uh, one of the things that has been uh, sent to us on a very regular basis in the last uh, couple of weeks uh, is this website uh, it, they've got a nice graphic there of the uh, United Nations logo let's take our planet back this is the United Nations New World Order project and of course whenever the term New World Order comes up uh, it's always very emotive and people get uh, uh, very excited about it but let's have a look at what they're saying uh, this the United Nations New World Order project is a global high-level initiative founded in 2008 to advance a new economic paradigm a new political order and more broadly a new world order for humankind which achieves the UN's global goals for sustainable development by 2030 uh, and the happiness well-being and freedom of all life on earth by 2050 so uh, <laughs> sorry I had to laugh at that point yes. we look at where we are now but by 2050 we're going to be in in happy world uh, absolutely absolutely so so this is all sounds very good um, well first of all 2008 they say they've uh, they they founded themselves um, well they only registered the domain name for this uh, in uh, 2018 so for 10 years they were operating behind the scenes without any public uh, face at all it's just a one-page uh, website uh, but at the moment but this is uh, this is what it's all about and what their key initiative here is happy tolism happy tolism uh, this is capitalism but happiness happiness attached to it or is it well we'll come on to that a little bit later we'll see what this is about um, so but it looks all very good it's all it's got a nice heart there within the 
uh, the the wreath of the uh, of the United Nations. So that must be good. And of course, children are always involved. They're going to be, make an impact across the globe. Hashtag 10 billion happy by 2050. So there's going to be 10 billion people happy by 2050. That's all very exciting. So the question is, who's behind this? Um, because it's actually not a United Nations website, as we'll show you in a second. Uh, but the first person behind it is uh, this guy. Uh, this is in, uh, Indaba Mandela. He's the grandson of Nelson Mandela. Uh, he apparently is an author, mentor, spokesperson, entrepreneur, political consultant. Uh, and I don't know what age he is, Brian, but it's, it's another one of these people that seems to be doing all these kinds of things with no experience of life whatsoever. He's, he's a special person, uh, Mike, and uh, we're going to be mentioning uh, the issue of special people a bit later in the news. Well, so we're going to meet a couple of special that. people here. So, so he's currently the co-founder and chairman of the Mandela Institute for Humanity. He's a member of the Pan-African Youth Council, which works closely with the African Union. Uh, he's the longest serving global ambassador for UN AIDS. Uh, and uh, so that, that, this is what he had to say. The 10 steps to global happiness call for action is our call for global unity and togetherness, the most critical ingredients in winning the fight of all humanity against this global outbreak and pandemic of COVID-19 coronavirus. And he went on to say, as my granddad, that's Nelson Mandela, said famously, it always seems impossible until it's done. Let us unite and work together to win this global fight and to achieve the happiness, well-being and freedom of all life on Earth. So we're going to uh, free all life on Earth by locking it down. But don't worry, they're working Wide towards bubbles. You're going to be in happy bubbles. Ha Mike. Happy bubbles. Yes, absolutely. That's uh, that's one of the people behind this uh, this organization. Uh, this is the other key uh, person here, uh, Jamie Elian, uh, who's the uh, founder and executive chairman of uh, the International Day of Happiness. Uh, so this is fantastic stuff. But who is it actually registered this unnwo.org website? Uh, well, it is in fact Ilian, uh, and uh, in fact it was the Ilian Global Public Benefit Corporation. Uh, that sounds very good it as well. It gives me a warm it's, feeling. It's a, it's a corporation. It's for the public benefit, and it's global, so it must be fantastic. So, what is this Ilian Global all about? Well, here it is. Uh, for over thirty-five years, Ilian Global has been dedicated to working with governments intergovernmental organizations, global financial institutions, the technology sector, global leaders, academia, civil society, and the broader private sector to advance the human condition, invest in the future, and promote, promote happiness for all. And you'll note that the term happiness for all is trademarked. Um, so that is a, that is a trademark, uh, nobody else can use it. So they're promoting happiness for all. The question is, what is happiness for all? If it's trademark, it must be something. Um, so uh, there's a little bit more on the IG happiness. Uh, it's fantastic. It's all about solutions, resolutions, and they've uh, UN resolutions that is, and, and of course they've got their international day of happiness. Um, but uh, well, Alien Global itself uh, was established in 1980 uh, when Anna Bell Alien established Alien Adoptions International Inc. with the mission to bring happiness to orphaned and abandoned children through finding them permanent loving families. And I'm not suggesting that there's any involvement in wrongdoing here, but you know, when we see these types of organizations yeah, very at big, this powerful level, big organizations, powerful organizations yeah. that, at this level, you know, there are people out there suggesting that, that there's global child trafficking going on. Uh, I'm not saying that this organization is involved in that, but but there is plenty of evidence that that type of thing is going on. Mm. And we've got to go back to Roly Post, for example, who was looking at the uh, European Union's uh, Romania. involvement with the trafficking of children from Romania. Absolutely. But let's come back to Jamie Ilian himself. Uh, and his story is quite amazing. Abandoned as an infant on the streets of Calcutta, India, Jamie Ilian was taken to Mother Teresa's International Mission of Hope Orphanage there by chance. Someone knew of a woman in the United States desperately wanting to adopt a child. Uh, my adopted mother got a call on her 45th birthday saying, we have a baby for you, he says. Annabelle Ilian not only adopted Jimmy, but after experiencing the challenges of the process firsthand, also founded Ilian Adoptions International, a nonprofit that has helped thousands of American parents navigate the international adoption process. So let's find out a little bit more about what happened to him since he was adopted from the streets of Calcutta. Uh, he uh, became international, uh, sorry, United Nations representative for economists for peace and security. Uh, 
Uh, so that includes people like Joe Stiglitz. So, you know, serious people at the top of the pyramid involved in this organization. So this is amazing stuff. Uh, he became the United Nations Iraq advisor. Uh, he was a clandestine officer program uh, incumbent for the US and Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, he was global head of DBFX, an online currency trading service of, Do service of Deutsche Bank. Uh, and he was lead strategic advisor, is lead strategic advisor at blockspeed.com, an institutional cryptocurrency. So wow. this is the man who is pushing... quite a man. Quite, quite a man. man, quite a man. He, this is the man who is pushing happiness for us all. Uh, and he's undoubtedly operating through all these uh, mechanisms to produce happiness. But the question is, what is capitalism? So this is the key thing, and here is his definition. Capitalism is informed through the entirety of economic, political, and social models, systems, political philosophies, and theories that have come and gone throughout human history, such as capitalism, socialism, communism, mercantilism, and feudalism, amongst others. Capitalism is uniquely grounded in the timeless wisdom of all the great sages of humanity, as well as the great philosophers, political scientists, business, economic and spiritual leaders, and the preeminent academics and epistemic community of experts in the field of happiness, well-being, and more broadly, human development and the human condition. So I'll appreciate that this needs a little bit of translation, but basically the first bit, uh, it's informed through capitalism, socialism, communism, mercantilism, and feudalism. This is fusion doctrine on steroids. This is bringing every possible economic uh, ideology together into one thing. Uh, and of course, the one world church is, is at the background of this as well. When he mentions spiritual leaders, might that'll be the one world uh, church. I was more interested in the, in the separation between the idea of the great sages of humanity and spiritual <laughs> leaders, because there, there must be a difference between those. And, and you know, the, the point here is that everywhere you look, when you start looking at these types of organizations that are hovering around the United Nations, you find the names Helena Blavatsky and Alice Bailey. They're there, they're everywhere in this lot. And the problem is uh, that it doesn't really matter what uh, we might believe personally, what they believe is important here. Right. And okay. they see themselves, these types of people, they see themselves as the sort of Blavatskyite, uh, uh, what is it, great white brotherhood sort of thing, these, these global uh, elites that, that, that um, are there to guide the, the, uh, the uh, humanity forward through, through its... Uh, uh, they're going to guide us. They're going to guide us. Yeah. Uh, and Alex, uh, this looks to me like ideology. This isn't about economics and people being happy. This is an ideology that they have developed amongst themselves and are, are, are building. And I, I'm just going to ask the question, what is these types of, of uh, organizations and, and initiatives that we see hovering around the United Nations, what are they? They are corporatized embodiments of resentment. I think that's the best word to use for them. Uh, some 30 years before the United Nations got going, um, Max Scheler, S-C-H-E-L-E-R, wrote his rebuttal to Nietzsche just before the First World War broke out. And Max Scheler was the latest of several political philosophers to say that the reason why humanity had tended towards extremism in the 19th century, including these second-hand figures that you mentioned, like Madame Helena Blavatsky and Alice Bailey around the turn of the 20th century, the reason why these people uh, who were passing off cod philosophies as, as if they were original or grand uh, got going is because the 19th century had seen this growth of a a narrow bourgeoisified society that was, uh, to quote the, the language you were using there, it was mercantilist. It was, we make the money, we are the merchants, we should rule. Um, we, we want a way with old aristocracy and ideas of grandeur, heroism, nobility, calling, noblesse, uh, the nobility of labor, um, patriotism, religion, all these things had to go. And so it's early modern Europe that starts doing this. And the political philosophical term, which has been hidden, which Scheler reveals, is this idea of ressentiment, resentment. How should, you know, these guys didn't earn their privilege, for example, the church, uh, any, any kind of monarchy or, or lords over us. And so this leads to the ferment of communism. Now, in order to give this a presentable face, 
uh, the oligarchs uh, on their own turf, if you look at how San Francisco and the grounds uh, in which the UN was founded were privately owned, the, the tax exempt foundations uh, set up these uh, undertakings, the United Nations and its huge underbelly of, of associated organizations, in order to make it look as though the great thinkers and the people of the world are coming up with new strategies to share everything out equally. The underlying philosophy, however, is simple resentment and the triumph, but also the tragedy of the 19th century is that we finally realized with our new philosophical, religious, spiritual insights and scientific understanding what had gone wrong. But also we also that the bad people t perfected the technique of presenting resentment to the masses. So this is if you invert everything you've just presented, Mike, as we have to with these people, it's not happiness that's being made widespread and, and yeah. ubiquitous. It's resentment. Mm. It's resentment and unhappiness. Well, if our viewers and listeners keep that picture in their minds, um, let's jump to the subject of Dominic Cummings. And I just thought this would be an interesting comment from, uh, I think it was former children's minister at one stage, Tim Lawton MP. Has the action of Dominic Cummings threatened to undermine the message of the government and its ability to carry on its work? I'm afraid, regretfully, it has, and that's got to be dealt with. So naughty um, Dominic Cummins drove up, he broke the ban, or that's the what's being alleged, and went to see his parents. He might have done something else. Um, and he's been a bit naughty, he's undermining really what the government's policy is, and uh, he's got to go. I'm going to label this um, that I think Tim Lawton here is utterly clueless as to what's really happening in government. And let's have a look at uh, Dominic Cummings. Now, this was quite a common sort of thread across the uh, across social media, but at quite high level. And Tim Lawson's tweeted this one out. It's Julia Hartley Brewer, um, who is a journalist. I don't understand what the purpose of the media circus, uh, circus outside Cummings' home is. He's answered all the questions put to him. You either believe him or you don't. No need to harass him, his family, or indeed cause a nuisance to his neighbours. So it's poor little Dominic Cummings, leave him alone. Now, the big interview was uh, with him sat outside in the sh sunshine, um, taking questions from the press. Would love to show you this BBC clip, but if we do, even though the public have paid for the BBC's report, the BBC will be after us for copyright. So we just have to comment on a picture. So here he is, and here's the BBC clip. But the interesting thing about this is what he was saying and those subtitles were completely different. So if your brain was trying to get hold of what Dominic Cummings was actually said, it was very difficult to do because the written statements coming up didn't bear any relation to what was coming out of his mouth at any particular time. And I would say that was deliberate, Mike, and I would say it was a, a fairly blatant piece of uh, propaganda and manipulation. But we did pay attention to what he said. And in one segment, he said this, I'm here to try and do the best I can for the government, to try and change the country for the better in lots of ways, to get more investment into the NHS, to do all sorts of things we've talked about during this crisis. I have been trying to do the best I can to make the government machine work as well as possible. If the Prime Minister thinks I should stop, that's up to him to decide. It's not up to me to decide. So it's poor Dominic Cummings. He's been doing his very best for the country, for government, for the NHS. And he's quite a nice guy and he should be allowed to get on with his job. Well, we're going to say thank you very much to UK column viewers who were taking a rather more in-depth look than the BBC. And this is part of his blog. Now, this is interesting because it relates back to when he put a tweet out saying that he wanted to hire weirdos. And this gives uh, some of the information about what, what was involved with hiring those weirdos and what he was after. Uh, but let's bring in the second piece here because um, it says that there's a confluence of Brexit which requires many large changes in policy and the structure of decision making. So we leave the EU and the whole country's got to be changed for some reason, Mike. Some people in government prepared to take risks to change things a lot. A new government with a significant majority and little need to worry about short term unpopularity while trying to make rapid progress with long term problems. These are all general generalities, vagaries, but clearly we're talking about the repurposing of government. 
and if we upset a few people he says we shouldn't worry about it um, but he says there's a huge amount of low-hanging fruit trillion dollar bills lying on the street in the intersection of the selection education and training of people for high performance there's your high performance is that people. common purpose uh, it's very common purpose language the frontiers of the science of uh, prediction data science ar ai communication decision making institutions so this man is uh, very much a wizard at the heart of government and this is one paper that a particular lady picked up uh, we'll come back onto this in a minute but it's talking about ARPA and park style science research uh, if you could just give us 30 seconds on that aspect well he's, he's just talking about the early days of the internet uh, park came out of xerox uh, it developed the initial uh, network switching that, yeah. that helped build the internet so so he's uh, talking about uh, building something along that model building something along that model and then two the reform of government institutions so that high performance teams with different education training the tetlock processes and tools including data science and visualizations of interactive models of complex systems can make quote better decisions in the complex world this is getting pretty deep uh, and it gets deeper because here you'll notice that he's referring to meditations on Moloch uh, which we'll put to Alex in a minute but let's move on through uh, there's the Moloch uh, poem and it's got a lot of theory about the fact that we're in such a state because effectively we're in a Moloch world um, but he doesn't leave much room for God in there which I just noticed but let's come back on to a bit more of what he says putting it on screen so that you can see it for yourself and highlighted a bit here the ARPA Park history shows that a combination of vision a modest amount of funding with a felicitous context and process can almost magically give rise to new technologies that not only amplify civilization but also produce tremendous wealth for the society isn't it time to do this again by reason even with quote no cold war to use as an excuse now this is a quote by a park researcher but i think this is pretty deep stuff and we're back on saving the world amplifying civilization but oh dear there's no cold well uh, cold war to hang it off so. yeah i'm not so, i'm not sure that it was a general uh general generally producing a tremendous wealth for society tremendous wealth for a few few key people yeah. like bill gates and and some other Indeed. big names well let's add the next bit here uh, another quote is i have to live in the same cage with these monkeys a professor replied to a plea for help in a bureaucratic war and this i think is getting us into the mindset so we'll contrast it with what we showed a few minutes ago the selection education and training of people of for high performance this is your future leaders but you're working with monkeys at the moment and what i sense in reading this man's material is some really unpleasant undertones it's the key performance people versus the untermention alex um cummings an innocent individual who was just doing the right thing to see his uh, parents up country maybe but when i look at the material he's talking about this man is is into the darkest of political dark arts well of course there's always the get out clause for people who blog um, or make offhand comments about moloch or other such aspects by the way moloch of course is the god uh, of the surrounding nations around israel in the old testament who demands the sacrifice of children uh, in the old days through fire but in the carthaginian model where he's sometimes worshipped as chronos or saturn that comes into roman greece and ultimately takes the form of just abandoning children and it's been often compared with abortion in the modern world a kind of toll of one's children for the privilege of continuing to live in the fiefdom um, people can always get use the get out clause that i was just you know musing intellectually but there's something very dark about this uh, for sure if you think about the artist goya and his famous um, fresco which i think he had in his living room so he lived with the painting every day it has saturn devouring his children that's another version from the roman pantheon of the same idea if you remember this shaggy old figure you know tearing a limb off his uh, off his son and, and gobbling it down that's what moloch is about um you know it's 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 give me your children 
uh, what is going on with Cummings, you know, especially with this deliberately shabby appearance, almost a put on an act, which we see, I'm sorry to mention this in the same sentence as Cummings, but I have to, we see also with the deceitful abusers. I'm not suggesting anything untoward on Mr. Cummings' part, but I'm making the visual comparison. The, they have in common with him that they deliberately put on shabby clothes and shuffle around when in fact they're high IQ and prefer to be very clean and spotless in behind closed doors. What's going on here? It's it's a kind of exaltation of the mind, uh, separating the mind from the feelings. So dividing the personality up, and you know there isn't time to go into great detail, but it is a radically different way of ruling Britain and the world through the civil service than that favoured by Mark Sedwell and his Sedwill and his ilk, which is probably why there is a great turf war between them now. Sedwill basically follows Aristotle Aristotelian thinking more and um, Cummings follows Platonic, but the end point is still the domination of the pyramid by a very few. Um, okay, well, speaking of, of dark subjects, Alex, uh, the Tavistock Institute here uh, pushing uh, an article, Corona Times Notes, The Virus of Horror. This is by Joseph or Yossi Triest, uh, whose uh, biography from another website I've plunked at the bottom there for reference, but uh, a, quite a, a major psychoanalyst and a clinical psychologist, um, honoured in his national institutions. The key point here is that this has been carried on the website of the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, uh, a shocker of an institution for which I can, uh, for background, best recommend Daniel Estulin's book on that theme, simply called the Tavistock Institute. Basically, they are, at least in their post-war model, they are a consultant group of psychologists, psychiatrists and psychoanalysts who uh, spin for major clients, reportedly including even international banks, right up to the Bank for International Settlements, they work out how to spin certain narratives, to embed or tweak narratives that are in our subconscious in order to oblige compliance or adherence or convergence are the words that are often used these days. But why would Tavistock Institute, based in, in London, be carrying such a dark piece? Uh, it, it reads more like uh, you know, dystopian literary uh, criticism um, than it does uh, actual psychoanalysis that, that what you've just blown up is the second half of the real paragraph of shock of uh, shock value which was spotted by our viewers in our forum for which many thanks i'll read the whole paragraph uh, which is entitled or, or the, the last part of the article is entitled post corona psychotherapy right uh, this is after a lot of should we say dark guff starting off with edgar Allan poe and blood and gore and so on so in the crucial paragraph yossi triest writes we will see those who have experienced the oppression and impoverishment forced on them by the confinement and who were somewhat shocked to discover that they had spent their entire lives in confinement. Those who had celebrated the breached boundaries of virtual life and now realise that they always had a tendency to become infected with undifferentiated viral likes which blurred their identity as well. Those who have found out that their relentless pursuit of a professional career out in the world was nothing but a narcissistic addiction to success, which suddenly feels empty. Those for whom being forced to stay at home has uncovered an overwhelming dependency and a constant sense of suffocation in their intimate relationships. Those for whom the entire world grinding to a halt was the very first moment of being free of malignant envy of just about anyone. And those for whom speeding down an empty highway has shamefully brought them face to face with a grandiose self that cried out with glee, make way for my royal highness. And those who realised that the mask they put on their face had always been there naturally when it fell off and were shocked to see themselves looking for real and imaginary ways to arm themselves due to a deep and archaic anxiety fantasy by which when the world runs out of food they will have to protect their families from cannibal manhunters until with a slight delay and to their unmitigated horror they realize that they do not necessarily envision themselves on the side of the hunted what the blazes has this got to do with public health measures. Even allowing for the fact that this is a psychoanalyst, um, what on earth is this gentleman in Israel uh, doing using the bully pulpit of uh, a London-based worldwide operating psychonarrative consultancy uh, in order to talk about how the plebs are going to be reframed and how their horror is going to come to the surface and how they're going to be devoured or possibly even hunt others? Uh, 
it seems to be a slightly more extreme uh, version of what Spy B was doing, Brian, really. Well, well, Spy B is a subset of that whole model, which is, is, is very dark and serious. I, it's arrogance I, I pick up with these things. It's almost like the individuals, <clears throat> excuse me, who are involved with this sort of thing are now boasting there's more and more of it coming into public view. And of course, the Spy B, that behavioural insights group within the SAGE unit, um, they were very happy to be promoting fear in order to get their agenda through. It's very sinister stuff. People need to get the lid off it, be pointing fingers at it, and that'll be the start to getting it stopped. Indeed. Uh, OK, now, if you like what the UK Column does, you'd like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community. There are options to help us out there uh, and your help much needed, much appreciated. Uh, a reminder that David Noakes is still in Exeter prison. If you'd like to write to him, his prison number is A7081DY and it's HMP Exeter 30 New North Road, Exeter EX4 4EX. Where does that take us? Um, Alex, uh, this takes us to Karlsruhe. Now you were covering this, you introduced this subject on, I think it was two weeks ago, 13th of May. Uh, this is uh, a constitutional, German constitutional court case going on at the moment. So on screen at the moment is on the eve of the verdict. At the start of May, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, the main Munich quality paper, uh, had its deputy chief of economic reporting in their Berlin bureau say that there were great nerves in Berlin because uh, if the wrong verdict, i.e. that Germany was not constitutionally able to participate in Euro bond, or sorry, European Central Bank bond purchase, if that were to come out, then the government was going to, on the very next morning, send a very strong signal about the integrity of the euro and the final line in the piece rather incongruously said after all let's remember that Alternative für Deutschland the anti-establishment party got going on an anti-euro platform it's almost as if you know the the squashing of a small party in Germany uh, is the is the key consideration here rather than the prosperity and stability of markets and savings um, so then we move on to uh, what's happened immediately after this verdict. Ursula von der Leyen, who of course was a German front rank politician and minister before she went off to uh, preside over the European Commission, issued this rather uh, punchy uh, brief statement on the 10th of May, threatening which is something which in the treaty uh, or the two treaties on the European Union, which came out of Lisbon, the TEU and the TFEU, one new and one revised, is the ultimate sanction or weapon of the European Commission against member states, which is infringement proceedings, which means you, we think you member states have breached the terms of the treaties. In this, so she's, she's saying halfway down that the last word on EU law is always spoken in Luxembourg, nowhere else. And non-Germans might miss what she's saying there. She is almost um, you know, bearing her teeth back across the Rhine at uh, her, her own German political class, uh, which is quite wedded to the idea of the, the rule of law through the constitutional court in Germany and saying, no, this is, a, this is EU law. The EU has from the outset, um, particularly since the 1960s judgments, the famous ones like uh, von Henden, Loos and Costa Enel maintained that it has its own legal order and that only the European Union's own court of justice is uh, qualified to judge what is lawful. So, you know, she regarded it as an upstart measure by the German constitutional court to say, no, without any kind of proportion um, of your involvement being uh, evident, German government, it is not lawful for you to participate in this because you're putting German savers and, uh, and the entire taxpaying system on the hook for unknown debts. Here is the trade paper in Germany, Handelsblatt, responding to the piece. And this is actually just from yesterday. This is quite an eye opener, too. Um, they have got insiders. Uh, saying that the famously opaque ECB, which uh, the main complaint against which is that it never uh, has responsibility and accountability to anyone because it's got basically diplomatic immunity. The ECB is now letting it be known through these controlled leaks that it itself or possibly uh, the non-German central banks within the Eurozone member states are preparing to buy out Germany's share in this purchase scheme, which has been going on since 2015. That's the European version of quantitative easing. And if things get to a really, if a push comes to shove, the ECB is letting the Handelsblatt know that it might even sue the German National Bank, the Bundesbank, to oblige it to participate in bond purchasing. I don't know whether, Mike, there's any kind of financial precedent to that. Perhaps you'd like to comment in a moment, but I'll just cover the last slide on this section, which is the Dutch reaction. Here's just one example from the Dutch equivalent of the Guardian, de Volkskrant. Uh, which usually is is quite sort of um, 
uh, pro-EU and smug in such matters, but they're giving space here to a colonist to say that all that's happened here is the Germans have reiterated their old understanding that there is no such thing as free money. And he's saying, what's taking us in the Netherlands so long to work that out? Well, some retired front, um, uh, front benchers in Dutch politics are starting to say we have to get rid of the euro now, which is something that Joe Stieglitz, as you mentioned, was already saying in uh, 2016, even the mainstream Keynesian uh, um, economists were starting to say this. Um, other Dutch commentators have said things like the EU is toast. We're looking for Euro Armageddon. You know, it's it's a very, very serious situation now. Uh, well, indeed, and that, that seems to be, uh, I mean, I'm not entirely certain what's going on with the EU at the moment. That There's obviously this argument over whether uh, there should be continuing bond purchases at an EU level in the German constitutional court. But, but Alex, just on a general point, um, there's supposed to be a negotiation going on with the UK at the moment about our future relationship. That doesn't seem to be happening to any great degree. But the other thing that we should note is that with respect to COVID-19, there was no EU response. The response to COVID-19 was managed at a, at a national level. And, and this is something that still kind of surprises me. And I'm asking the question to you, but this is a general sort of rhetorical question. What is going on with the EU at the moment? Is it actually going to be in existence in 12 or 24 months time? Because it seems that they aren't making any progress on some of their key goals at the moment. And in fact, they seem to be drawing back from them. Well, there was a strategic assessment paper, wasn't there, on the options for the EU in the ferment of Brexit, uh, which suggested that we could do, you know, the EU could do less, better, or it could even, you know, devolve back to a confederation or even a loose association of, of member states. I think these things are on the cards. You know, the, the key consideration from the EU's legalistic point of view within the EU lawyer bubble is that they would point to these two treaties which now have the initials TEU and TFEU that's the latest in a series of rehashings of the same founding treaty basically but those um, treaties do have articles saying that there cannot be uh, measures taken by the EU through the European Commission or directives or regulations or financial measures which have as their primary motive the promotion of public health the member states have never signed that away so that's the defence that they will fall back on when you ask the EU, why aren't you promoting public health? There has been jurisprudence uh, with, uh, you know, a, a famous tobacco advertising case brought by Germany uh, in which the outcome was uh, it was it was actually sharpened up that um, if you wanted measures to promote public health, you had to make that a secondary aim and that the key purpose for that or the key legal basis for the measure would still have to be the promotion of the internal market. Uh, but it's it's not an argument that carries much weight in Italy or Spain after the uh, the shocking results of the, of uh, or the death tolls of this this spring. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. We'll we'll keep an eye on that. And now we just want to end uh, with this one um, because uh, a lot of people are sending this to me. I uh, just wanted to give a little bit of comment on it. This is VST Enterprises Limited. Uh, they call themselves a UK based cybersecurity firm. Uh, they've developed, they claim, a digital health passport. Now, of course, immunity passports have been lauded by the, the British government for quite some time, not quite a number of weeks now, and for pretty much from the beginning of this. So it shouldn't really be a surprise that this type of thing is starting uh, to come up. Uh, they, they, they've basically only registered this, uh, this vhealthpassport.co.uk domain name in the last couple of weeks. So this is kind of opportunistic in the sense that they had a technology that, that, uh, that they had developed uh, and they want to try to roll it out for this particular purpose. Now, what is that technology that they developed? Well, it's this uh, V-code. Um, and uh, so they're saying that the, that the V-Health Passport is going to be a simple to use ID system that can display various health status about the passport holder. We'll show that in a second. Uh, but V-code they describe as a two-dimensional code that links the physical world to a purchase or any form of information and acts as a secure identifier. Uh, so you can assign any form of uh, information to this uh, that could be uh, health information, emergency information, uh, payment methods, car registration numbers, business card details, social media links, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, well, this is what they want to do with it. Uh, they, this is how they're considering implementing it at this stage. Uh, manage your assigned passes. Basically, the, the uh, uh, immunity passport would be, you'd either be green, amber, red, or if you haven't actually been discovered whether you're immune or not, it might be blue. What they've basically done is taken the, the Chinese model. This follows on from what Patrick was, uh, 
was saying uh, a week or so ago about everything being, the, you know, the, the policy that they're trying to roll out being made in China. This is another perfect example of it. This is exactly what the Chinese have been doing. Uh, they're wanting it to, to bring it to the West and to sell it. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, you get your own V code, V code store loyalty, bank cards, much more in your own V code. Uh, it's there are lots of competing uh, organizations moving into this space at the moment, Brian. Uh, this is this is another one. Um, yeah. But, you know, the question is, if they are going to, if the argument here is that, that in order to, to get a room at a hotel or to get a flight or get on a ferry, you're going to need your immunity passport, then uh, really, if people aren't happy with that, the question that has to be, that people need to be asking themselves is whether they want to, to, to continue to, uh, do these types of things and maybe they want to boycott the types of organizations that uh, yeah that, that are pushing for this well, Mike's getting very easy to see that uh, COVID you know was the front end but it's what comes behind COVID which is the really dangerous thing and it's coming to the surface very easily Alex uh, 20 seconds to close I would just like to point viewers towards the output that Jason Goodman has been putting out on his YouTube channel of that name because he's been a, uh, at the front end of um, lifting the stone, as it were, of, of what's under this, this legal mumbo jumbo. If people look at the most recent videos on his YouTube channel, um, there's one in which he uh, challenges uh, the famous uh, sorry, um, constitutional uh, law specialist uh, Dershowitz um, and uh, rings him up and says, why are you falsely uh, accusing me of having sprung on you this interview, which went so terribly wrong for you, uh, in which you said that you know, the government has an absolute right to jab a needle in your arm. And uh, Dershowitz just tells him to get lost. Of course, Dershowitz has also been implicated in uh, the Brian Epstein, uh, sorry, the uh, um, Jeffrey Epstein scandal uh, in a very core uh, way as well. So it's odd how some of the people presenting themselves, even as libertarian lawyers um, or, you know, uh, that kind of end of the spectrum, turn out on closer inspection to be in, in the same cabal again and to have apparently you know, to aims that of libertarian interest which cut across their actual uh, feelings which come to the surface in interviews so uh, do go and check that out okay excellent well big thank you to all our um, listeners and viewers and also big thank you to people who are sending us um, really personal emails saying that uh, watching the UK column is keeping them sane that's come from quite a few people in these amazing times we come or to watch the UK column because it keeps us sane it keeps us understanding that what we think and see what our common sense tells us is right and that must be a big compliment for us so thank you very much for passing that through to us and of course we say don't just listen uh, and watch what we're talking about take that information and get um, tackling your MPs and anybody else that you can think of it's the action that's the important thing that's it for today thank you very much for joining us bye bye